It is Thursday afternoon, folks. Ted Rawson here in our downtown Honolulu studios of ThinkTech Hawaii, overlooking uh, gorgeous downtown Honolulu. We have, uh, on the other end of the continent here, 6,000 digital miles away, we have Jim Williams joining us for the second time on this show. Jim, boy, you look, you look bright and blue there, Jim. And uh, welcome aboard our show again. Well, I've seen your shirt. I wish I'd wore the uh, the Hawaiian shirt I bought the last time I was with you. You bought it right down the street from here last <laughs> time when you were addressing the U.S. District Court, and you were properly dressed in an Aloha shirt. I was expecting you to uh, uh, to do the same. You could actually use that furniture behind you. It looks kind of like an Aloha shirt, and you could uh, presume that's uh, <laughs> that's a stand-in for you. Hey Jim, it's good. I decided see you. to wear my uh, shirt with my new logo on it that's, instead, as a as a shameless ad for my my new company. That, that's great. Let's talk about your new company. We are shameless on this show. I mean, the whole idea is to promote people who are doing the right thing and doing good things. And uh, you're, I mean, obviously in the middle of that, having come from the lineage with uh, aerospace industry and the FAA, and then the business and and uh, legal industry, and now on your own. So right. tell well, us, I was Jim, very fortunate to uh, be able to become a consultant working for Dentons. They were very good to me and helped me teach me how to be a consultant. Uh, but the, the time came where, where it was just a better fit for me to be on my own. So now I'm an independent consultant. And to my um, uh, really pleasant surprise, they actually have more business now than I did with, with Dentons. And so I'm working as hard as I can to uh, help everybody out who wants me to help them out. And that's in the world of drones or unmanned air systems or remotely piloted aircraft or the software that goes with them or the insurance required to make them into a business, all of the above. Right. Yes, and you know, I'm not, I don't limit myself to just unmanned aircraft, but that's where there's the most need right now for people with my knowledge about how the FAA works, about how the national airspace system works, about how the infrastructure that makes it capable of, of working, how all that works, and then how the, the drones are gonna fit into that infrastructure to become part of the routine day-to-day -day operations. So uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. There's a lot, of, a lot of stuff going on. There's a compelling need for clear and concise educational information that can advise the public, advise legislators, advise our business leaders and our our government people in what this is all about. It, it's so, the information is so scattered and it's so hard to interpret that it results in a lot of confusion, Jim, these days. And so anything we can collectively do to improve that uh, would be great. We had this experience this year. We had, what, 25 bills in the Hawaii Senate, our legislature, I should say, that dealt with UAS in some way. About eight had a lot of content UAS oriented and actually one of them was positive the others were very uh, uh, misstructured or, or, or confused and none of them even the one that was positive got past the various uh, authorization steps so what did we do wrong well, we had a lapse of education coming in the front end letting people be prepared for making good decisions in this regard you must see that all over I do, and I've actually been asked to join the Drone Advisory Committee uh, to help with those very issues. Uh, the Drone Advisory Committee was formed by the FAA as a very high-level uh, in uh, high-level advisory body to the FAA. Uh, it's chaired by uh, Mr. Chris Anich, who's the head of Intel, and co-chaired by the Deputy Administrator of the FAA. And the folks who are actually members of the Drone Advisory Committee are very high levels in their company. The real work is getting done by a subcommittee that's, that's looking at uh, three main areas right now. Uh, one of them is how to, how to fund the FAA, uh, which is a very interesting uh, to, to do the drone work because the FAA is currently funded uh, two ways. One through uh, taxes on fuel. Uh, for the general aviation community, and the other is on is taxes on uh, plane tickets that we all buy and, and pay, and that's how it's funded. Well, drones aren't going to pay either of those for the most part. Maybe a few of them will pay a little bit of tax on fuel, but uh, so the bottom line is there's a huge need for work to be done by the, uh, the federal government and especially the FAA, but they're not getting any additional funding to do that additional work, and, and all of the old work is still there. None of that's gone away. 
So they're looking at maybe how to figure that out. The second group is looking on, you know, sort of the, the fundamental issues about getting access to the airspace, things like flying beyond visual line of sight and helping to figure out ways to break those barriers down. But the third committee, the one that I've worked, the subcommittee that I've been asked to work on is addressing exactly what you're talking about, Ted, which is how, where do you draw the line between state and federal responsibilities when it comes to uh, managing drones? And, and it really is a fascinating area that I uh, spent a lot of my time while I was at the FAA dealing with. Uh, what the federal authority is quite clear and quite uh, comprehensive when it comes to aircraft. And Congress has declared unmanned aircraft to be aircraft, so therefore all of the, the rules and, and legal findings that apply to aircraft apply to, the, apply to unmanned aircraft. But what traditionally has been uh, a state responsibility is dealing with legal issues between individuals. So if I'm flying my drone over my neighbor's yard, I'm now interfering with his freedoms and his ability to, to live his life. And that traditionally has not been a federal role. That's been a state and local role. So you have this conflict between the traditional role of the state and the traditional role of the federal government. And so this group is trying to come up with recommendations to go back to the FAA and potentially even to Congress to say, hey, we need to uh, change things so that this delineation can be clear, so that uh, those issues between individuals can be resolved with, at the level they need to be resolved. Because obviously the FAA, you can't pick up the phone and, and dial 911 and get the FAA, you're going to get your local police department. So fascinating stuff, and I'm looking forward to participating in that. The chairman is, uh, they're having difficulty of communication, and the chairman has asked me to come in and, and, and use my ability to sort of communicate this stuff in ways that both sides can understand. You know, as I hear about that, the Drone Advisory Committee, there's a couple of things, you know, many things come to mind, but we've had on this show in the last couple of weeks, we've had uh, uh, Charles um, Werner from the Virginia Department of Emergency Management, who's mm -hmm. acting on behalf of NFPA to pull together end user needs from all public safety and law enforcement and public PAO basic usage of drones to represent that into the standards committee that ANSI is structuring. We mm -hmm. have uh, F-38 uh, committee and ASTM that's working on technical standards for chips and for uh, flight performance and things like that. We have RTCA, which in its most recent meeting, I believe, talked about the same things you're speaking of, that is the rights and the issues associated with uh, yeah, the, uh, the RTCA uh, runs the Drone Advisory Committee, so it? that's exactly okay, what Okay, that's what it ties together. And then we have uh, uh, half a dozen other 501s or forms of organization that have uh, been in, in put in place to collect and try to manage this old future. It, if you look from a God's eye from on top somehow, it must still look a little bit confused because there are just so many pots boiling and uh, they're all boiling the same stuff, more or less. Uh, some have more water in and some have less. Some might be using salt water and some using glycerin, but they're all boiling something and they're, they're distilling something out of it. So, uh, and then we see a lot of that working with the, uh, our local police and fire and, and the federal agencies out here as well. And then within the test ranges, our task is to go test these things and find where the points of failure are and find where the regulations and the technology has to be improved. So uh, if you were to call together a group of all the people in the country who think they're involved in this and are coming up with standards, you'd probably get 10,000 people to show up. Yep, we need a good sized football stadium to hold them all. Exactly, and so uh, it becomes an, a, a fascinating problem and you're at the center of it. And I'd like to offer uh, from the perspective of our test ranges that I think we have something to offer here in this domain as well. Uh, I'm not sure what it is yet. So I offer it I to mean, you, Jim. I'm prejudiced because I'm the one who helped set those test ranges up when I was at the FAA. And I, I, I think they're extremely valuable and uh, encourage anybody in the industry who's looking to do any sort of testing to reach out to the, to the one nearest them or who gives them the best deal. Because now all the all six test ranges are allowed to go anywhere in the country to do their work, and uh, they're not constrained anymore by the state boundaries of where they started out. 
And so there's an opportunity there for a lot of learning that actually may occur at a level below what the conference room will see. I mean, what you learn in the field doesn't match what you thought up in the conference room a lot, as you know from your past and mine and everybody else's. So uh, we just have uh, so much to learn together. So do you think the Drone Advisory Committee is sort of at the top of this hierarchy of finding things out? Yeah, I think so. From the standpoint of the highest level of uh, interaction, uh, that that is tackling the big policy issues. But, but like you said, there's a lot of other bodies that are dealing with uh, different issues that are sort of layers down beneath what they're doing. Uh, so it's, you know, each, each activity for the most part, I mean, there are a few that I find fairly superfluous, but for the most part, Everybody's got their little niche, and they're working toward building solutions that'll help uh, with the overall integration and moving moving things forward. Well, you know, uh, it 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 really got to put take your hat off to guys like David Place and Robin Alexander and uh, uh, Jonathan Rubrich and people like that who have the energy and the capability of pulling together like news summaries of what's going on and pass them around to all of us. It's uh, yes. it's. We need a USA Today version of droneism, Jim. <laughs> well, you can you uh, for a while I had these uh, Google. You can set up on your Google account a daily email, and you you put in the keywords you want to search for, and it'll find every article out there that match those keywords. Well, if you do that for drone, you wind up with pages and pages and pages of articles every day. Uh, and, and it just got to be where it was taking too much time just to, to wade through them to try to ferret out the, the new information. It's, it's just, it's exploding. Right. You don't have enough time to delete them all. Let's pick up this whole subject of education, though, and getting information out to the public. It's going to be a very serious issue, and our, all of our legislative sessions begin in about six months, at, right after our break. Yep. Well, education... You're watching Think Tech Hawaii. 25 talk shows by 25 dedicated hosts every week, helping us to explore and understand the issues and events in and affecting our state. Great content for Hawaii from ThinkTech. This guy looked familiar. He calls himself the Ultra Fan, but that doesn't explain all this. Why? Why? He planned this party, planned the snacks, he even planned to coordinate colored shirts, but he didn't plan to have a good time. Go! Now you wouldn't do this in your own house, so don't do it in your team's house. Know your limits and plan ahead so that everyone can have a good time. That had the safety, you know, a one-page set of safety rules. So, education is the key. Yeah, okay, that's that's a cool way to start the second half of our show here, Jim. Education is the key. That's kind of where we ended the first part, and then uh, during the break talked about it some more. So that's again, and I think in the educational domain, which I am in today at the University of Hawaii, as are many of the test ranges run by the universities, we have that obligation and that role, and we we see it. We could spend 100% of our time on that, and probably never exhaust it. Um, in fact, I'll send you. Um, a brief we gave recently to the uh, Geological Society of America. Of all people, the geologists, they want to use drones and UAS in various forms, and they have, no, they, they have no idea where to turn to establish their requirements and put forth what their needs are so they don't get lost or get left behind in terms of uh, people coming up with systems to uh, solve problems. Um, by the way, there is fun in this game, too. There's all the heavy lifting we all do and the, and the mind-boggling issues of education, but there is fun. I just wanted to bring up the fact that since this is a show about drones, we always have to have one on the table, and we have one here. And you'll be very happy to see, Jim, that uh, bearing on its uh, underside here, it's got some registration numbers that probably came from a place you know very well. And yep. uh, I use, the thing is so symmetrical, I use the registration numbers to tell Bob from Stern when... Uh, Airborne, I put them on the bottom. But anyway, um, we've got an activity going with uh, ONR right now to use unmanned air systems or drones as part of a man overboard situation off naval vessels. 
is sort of an automatic station keeping, searching and tracking, and f performing a beacon function over the, uh, over the man overboard. And then um, when the batteries expire, let it go in the ocean. Don't even bother recovering it. It's, its job is to seek and identify and then station keep on that guy. So sometimes this, this, uh, we do get a, get a chance to get our hands in and solder wires together and, and make things happen as well. But once again, back to the hard thing, education. Uh, uh, we even have a, a request here from in, in, the, in the Honolulu community to find some way to sort of, like the Civil Air Patrol does, manage the drone users, who some of them may be the clueless or some may be the, uh, the uninformed and such, but get them informed, get them to a, sta a standard level of appreciation for what they can do in an emergency situation, have them remain forever outside the yellow caution tape but have them provide information into that system, let that system digest it and use it as it wishes, sort of a citizen's drone patrol. So mm. we will be exploring how to go forward in that regard. But the nice thing about that is it does give us a reason to generate a basic level of training, a basic level of safety awareness and rules of the road and things like this, which will go against the grain of the, uh, of the nuisance factor that we all are, are seeing uh, all over the place. In fact, you know, a question that it comes to my mind a lot also is the manufacturers who, uh, the big manufacturers, DGI and that sort of thing, what, are they taking any overt action in the role of the nuisance control, nuisance management, or are they just standing by and letting it happen? Well, DJI, I think, has been very aggressive in their attempts to try to prevent uh, people from behaving cluelessly. Uh, their systems come, the newer ones with GPS come with geofencing built in. They, they basically look at all of the uh, airports in the country, they look at all of the airspace in the country, and they have that all in a database that's stored in the drone. And if you're close to it, it'll li it limits the height and won't let you go too high and it won't let you enter. If you're actually in one of these spaces where you're absolutely not supposed to be flying, it won't even start up it'll give you an error message. So they've been very aggressive about that. But given that they also do commercial drones, that people buy their drones and use them commercially, they have built in a way to override it. But in order to do that, you've got to go onto their website and acknowledge, sign up, basically sign something stating that you're operating where you shouldn't be unless you have a waiver from the FAA to do so. So there, I, I think that's a great compromise between, because Otherwise, they, you wouldn't be able to do commercial operations with one of their drones inside of the airspace where you could have uh, authorization to do so. That's good. That's like a two-level uh, uh, encryption, if you will. That is, you, you're, you, you have to take an overt action to override that limitation built in. That's good. We yep. have here in, in this state, and I'm sure most states do, beyond the uh, five-mile airport rule or the three-mile and two-mile heliport rules, we have a lot of uh, state parks and city parks, which have actually a somewhat uh, ambiguous rule set right now. And the uh, same issue applies. You have to get a waiver or some other means of permission to get into those areas. But it doesn't have the formality of a website that you can go to to get, your, uh, get the airspace released. We're going to have to get to that at some point in time, I guess, and that's just what it'll take. I mean, cars only drive on the road, right, in general. If you drive your car off the road, you get noticed pretty quick. So <laughs> some means of having that similar behavior control will have to occur here. But I, there is the other piece coming. There's going to be an automatic identification, uh, some kind of an electronic thumbprint uh, coming out, which mm -hmm. drones in the future are going to have to step up to. And then, as I get it, law enforcement in some form will be able to uh, recover that information and determine what's going on in the air around them. Is that? Yeah, this is one of the biggest things going on from both a technical standpoint and a policy standpoint right now. Last week, as a matter of fact, the FAA finally got its uh, task force, or uh, it's called an aviation rulemaking committee, where they invited a group of industry experts in to come up with a proposal for what those rules would look like and, and what approach should be used to establish remote identification requirements. Uh, this is important for a couple of reasons. The FAA was actually ready uh, last year to put out a rule for flight over people 
but they couldn't do it because they couldn't clear the uh, interagency coordination process uh, to allow them to release the rule for comment because of this remote identification uh, issue was raised by the law enforcement folks inside the federal government, essentially saying, look, if you authorize people to fly legitimately over crowds, how will we know the ones that are authorized and the ones that aren't? And so the FAA had to take a step back and say, all right, well, we're going to have to have a means of remote identification that law enforcement can activate in order to tell, okay, that drone over there, that one is legal, but that one over there isn't. And so we need to do something about the one over there. And, and that's what spurred this whole um, effort that's now ongoing. And I believe there's, their target is to be done with their recommendations by the fall so that the FAA can, can update their rule and get it out for comment uh, either by the end of this year or early next year. So that's a huge step forward for the FAA and I think for the industry. Now, note that this would only be for commercial drones, not for the hobbyists. Uh, as of now, unless the legislation changes, the FAA is prohibited from putting out new rules for hobbyists. And, and they were previously prohibited from doing that when they put out the registration rule that was overturned by a federal court earlier this month. So uh, they, they, they've learned their lesson, I guess, and the, you won't be seeing any more regulations coming out on hobby aircraft until such time as Congress either changes the law or they figure something out. You know, that, those evolving pieces of information, that, that whole concept of a thumbprint that comes forth electronically from the system is something that really changes how the legality aspects and the legal operation versus the illegal operation applies. And that one change could change how our legislative uh, rules come forth. And so that's another example of something we have to in, embed into the information we provide for our legislature uh, before the next session begins so they can see these things that are coming. And it made me think also, I, I mentioned that we have these uh, requests around here from our law enforcement community and our citizens uh, emergency response teams in the various towns to find a way to organize the local drone uh, fleets to support disasters as the case may be. We could come up with our own little identifier chip of some kind. It can't cost much. I mean, we have them on our, I have them on my keys so I don't lose them. We have them on our dogs. My wife has one on me so she doesn't lose me. And uh, <laughs> we can get, you know, these tags are not much at all. And uh, there's no reason in executing this local community team we couldn't do that. And if you haven't got a tag, you're not here. And uh, to get the tag, you have to go through training. You have to have a, a, a permit. What a, what a great idea. We'll just see if some uh, smart people under 15 can figure it out. I can tell you people over 70 can't. <laughs> Testifying on that one for sure. So Well, that's one of the great things that a, you know, a university could do uh, that had engineering and drone programs is they could look at solutions for this this problem and come up with something that was both inexpensive and easily uh, accessible. Yeah. One of the issues that's cropped up in this whole uh, agenda is, well, wait a minute, if I'm a commercial operator and I'm doing uh, filming and something sensitive, uh, I don't necessarily want any Tom, Dick, or Harry to be able to interrogate my aircraft and find out that that's me. Uh, it, just like license plates, you as a a citizen can't go query the database and find out where somebody lives just by looking at their license plate. So, you know, one of the complications that they're dealing with in this uh, remote identification arc is, well, how do you make the information available to law enforcement without making it available to the, uh, the you know, just John Q. public? Well, and, and that certainly leads to the question of who needs information what latency there is on the information, how it's going to be archived, and how long you're going to keep it. All the things associated with evidence sort of fit into the picture that you're describing here. But it makes me go back to one of our sessions in the legislature this year where we had, I think, uh, a lot of the conservation people interested in some of the rules that were being proposed for setbacks from, uh, from ecologically threatened areas. Some ecologists want to get in really close because they have to count the bird eggs in the nest and they have to identify the shape of the leaf to tell if the thing is invasive or not. The other people, other side of the conservation equation, 
want the drones kept back 500 feet so that nobody bothers any of those environments. So the same organizations have, in some cases, quite opposing needs. So the sooner we can pull those needs together uh, through educational programs and feedback from them, the better we can craft ways to use the technical things such as the electronic thumbprint and manage uh, the whole operation. So it's a big picture and it, it's a big challenge and uh, uh, it's kind of fun to be in it. And uh, I, one last question for you, Jim, knowing that what we went through last year in the legislature here and I'm sure everywhere else, what should we be doing now to get ready for six months from now when we will face even more questions and probably diverse opinions on this whole subject area at the uh, legislation season? Well, if they'll talk to you, I would reach out to the, you know, the leaders in the various committees who have jurisdiction over technology like unmanned aircraft and, and literally say, hey, we'd like to come in and talk to you about what's going on, what the issues are, how uh, the state can get involved, you know, make them aware of things that are going on, like the Drone Advisory Committee and the work that they're doing to ferret out the right way to break up the responsibilities between state and local. I mean, that, yeah, that would be my recommendation, that if you have the access, take advantage of it. Uh, you're right there in Honolulu. I assume a lot of them will, will be around that you can reach out to, uh, but if not, uh, Skype or whatever. If they're, you know, if they're truly interested, you know which committees that that these bills went through in the last legislative session. So you know who the leadership is that's going to be dealing with them come the next one. So educating the leadership is a good good place to start. You know, it, that's a great thought. And and the question is, what do we use as an artifact of that education? I would like to think of putting together a one page or two page flyer of some kind that's straightforward, run it back through you, see if you agree, and include in it the various national activities that are underway and what they might produce as let people conclude there's going to be some benefit coming from that. And start by maybe it's a three-phase thing. Here's what the environment is, here's where the uh, technology is going, and here's where the uh, national standards are starting to occur. Get that seed planted. And then start looking at how this might apply to use in law enforcement, public safety on the 107 side as well as the public aircraft side. And maybe a third thing, suggesting legislation that would be useful in our case to Hawaii. And uh, include you in on the, on the buildup of that, uh, recognizing of course that you only have uh, 24 hours in a day. Well, my you know, I want to make a living, but I'm also a big proponent of this technology. And, and one of the reasons that I got out of the FAA, uh, retired, was to be able to work on the industry side to help move things forward and, and find uh, solutions to some of these big problems. It's, it's difficult to do from, from inside everything that needs to be done. So uh, I'm very much involved in, so like the work that, that I would do uh, assuming I get approved to do it with the drone advisory committee, that would all be pro bono just on my own on time. So happy to help if, with that, especially if, if I get involved flyer, in that committee, then uh, it'll be directly applicable to what you're talking about. If we could do a flyer and have a drone advisory committee uh, sanction it or something, put their stamp on it, what a way to author to uh, uh, validate what this is what you can count on. So I will take that on, on this end, Jim, to write something up to start the ball rolling. Let's we'll see what we can do. Yeah, and I'll take the uh, action to talk to the, the co-chair of the subcommittee uh, about the yeah. idea of maybe putting something together that not just Hawaii could use, but, but all everybody, the Yeah, everybody can use, yeah. Okay, that's what we do on this show. We talk about things, make plans, and then go try to follow up, as you know from the last time you were here. So yep. we're, we've come to the end of our half hour. Jim, uh, thanks so much, Jim Williams of uh, uh, JLH Unmanned. No, J -J -H -W. J -H -W J -H -W Unmanned Solutions. And uh, uh, all the uh, hope and joy for the future of your great success and your individual effort. And I know that there's a lot of people around the country who are watching what you're doing and, and following as best they can. 
So, Jim, well, thanks for coming on on the show again. And I appreciate you inviting me. I, it's 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 almost as much fun as as being there, but it, you can never have as much fun outside of Hawaii as you can inside of Hawaii. So, uh, aloha and thanks again. And we're going over to Gordon Beers, and I'll buy you a beer. <laughs> oh, I wish. <laughs> uh, okay. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, and we'll Ted. See you all next Thursday, folks.